glad you are joining us today. We do live in challenging times, but Psalms 46 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Using modern tools and technology, we can learn, worship, and praise Him. If this is your first time joining us, we would like to extend a very special welcome, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you for your presence. God has given Liberty Baptist a mission to proclaim His message to the world, that God loves you and provided His own Son to be your Savior, serving in Stockbridge, Georgia, and across the globe via technology. Please make sure to like and follow us on the social media platforms such as YouTube, Facebook, and of course our website at lbcstockbridge.org. And share this with your family and friends. Thank you again for joining us. We appreciate your support. of Liberty Baptist Church. We're so glad you're able to join us today on the internet and we hope you enjoy our time together this morning. We're going to sing a song here in just a second and we'll do our best to worship the Lord under these extreme circumstances. So we'll have our Bible open in a moment. We'll be able to sing and praise the Lord together. Enjoy the song as, as they sing. Hello. Welcome to Liberty Baptist song this morning and uh, what a I can't think of a better song to begin with than that song glory to his name because whatever's Amen. happening in the world we want to make sure we give all the glory to our Savior Jesus Christ let's bow please for prayer and we'll ask God to bless our service this morning let's pray together please would you Lord we are just grateful that we can be gathered together Lord uh, and be able to worship our Savior this morning and we do thank you for this opportunity you've given to us though it may be a different than usual, Lord, we're still able to worship the Lord, we're still able to sing and able to preach this morning, and I pray today, God, that whatever our burdens are, whatever our fears are, we may be able to give all those to Jesus Christ, and would you speak uh, through the music, would you speak through the preaching, and whatever happens in this place and all over the world wide web today, we're going to be careful to give you all praise and all glory and all honor. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace greater than our sin.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed that music this morning. I want to invite you, please, to take your Bibles, if you have those ready, and open them to Ephesians chapter number 6. Begin reading in verse number 11 in just a moment, but I just want to take a, a moment and, uh, and, and, and say thank you to our ensemble for coming to sing for us this morning. And I want to thank uh, our sound guy for being here and doing all the behind-the-scenes things so we can have church this morning. And I want to thank you for listening today on the Internet, and thank you for doing so. We're going to do our best today just to honor the Lord by this service. And so I'd ask you, please, to look in Ephesians chapter number 6, and we're going to see in just a moment how the world has been turned to chaos, but God has not. God is still the same today, yesterday, and forever, and we are so glad about that. Glad to have a God who doesn't change just because everything else changes. God is always the same. We're going to see that this morning. As we look at Ephesians chapter 6, I began this series about two or three weeks ago before we were all asked to stay home and to be quarantined, if you will. And we began this series called We Are Overcomers. And we looked at, the first person we looked at was, was David. And David faced the giant, and we remember the story well. The giant was bigger than David. The giant had better weapons than David. The giant had more, more experience in fighting. But you see, David had something Goliath did not have. David had the Lord, and Goliath didn't. So we know that David was able to overcome this great uh, battle he faced. We're going to see this morning in Ephesians chapter 6 that you and I still today, we have weapons to help us as we fight our fears. Look in verse 11, please, of Ephesians chapter number 6. Listen to what Paul says. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in, in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then pay attention to verse 16, please. Above all, it's interesting, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I want to preach on this thought this morning, overcoming fear with faith. Overcoming fear with faith. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you today for your holy word. And Lord, I pray your word today might do what you promised it would do, and that's to, to speak to our hearts and draw us to the cross of Calvary. And help us today realize, understand that though our world is in turmoil, and while some people's life have been turned upside down by this terrible coronavirus, we understand, God, that we have a God who is above all these things. And He is the great physician. He's the great healer. He's really the one in charge of the entire universe. Nothing's caught God off guard, and nothing surprised Him. He's well able to take care of us during these times. And our job is to just live by faith. Live by faith and trust the Lord. Help us to do that this morning. I pray your word might encourage us and challenge us to take our shield of faith where we can withstand the fiery darts of the wicked one. Bless us this morning, please, and draw us to Jesus Christ, we pray, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I want to share with you a story about a man named Ken Davis. Ken Davis was a college student. Ken Davis was asked to do an experiment in a college class, and he and he does an experiment. The, the story tells us like this. He was doing his senior project. He delivered a talk to his speech class on the law of the pendulum. This law says that when a free-hanging weight swings back and forth, it'll swing a shorter distance due to the effects of gravity and friction. Eventually, it will stop and hang dead unless restarted. To demonstrate from a pivot at the top of a blackboard, Ken hung a three-foot string with a small weight attached to the bottom creating a simple pendulum. Setting the pendulum in motion so it swung parallel to the back blackboard, he made a mark on the blackboard at each outward point where the pendulum reached its arc. As the pendulum continued to swing, the length of each arc decreased, causing the marks to grow closer and closer to the center of the blackboard. That demonstrated the law of the pendulum in action. The law states that a swinging pendulum never again reaches the point from which it began its previous arc, Ken declared. Who believes this statement is true, he asked. A show of hands indicated that he convinced both the professor and the entire class. 
But Ken wasn't finished. Next, he asked his professor to stand with his back against the wall. Using a much heavier weight he'd previously attached to the ceiling with a strong rope, he pulled the weight from its center point, held it just an inch from the professor's nose, and let it go. The weight swung away from the professor, reached the end of its arc, and started back, heading straight towards the professor's face. But it never came close to touching the professor's face because he was gone. The sight of the weight heading towards him was more than he could take, and he dove out of the way. The professor may have said he believed the law of the pendulum, but he wasn't willing to put his faith to the test. Ken's point, faith can only be proven by action. As a follower of Jesus Christ, our lack of faith is seldom a matter of disbelief, but a matter of fear. I'll say it again, as a follower of Jesus Christ, our lack of faith is seldom a matter of disbelief, but it's a matter of fear. C.S. Lewis said this, Faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. With that being said, the emotion of fear very often enslaves us. It very often has such an influence on our life that it can destroy all we know to be true. Today in our, in our world, there's Christians all around our world today, they're living in fear because of a virus. They're worried, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to get the virus? Am I going to lose a loved one? Am I going to lose my IRA? Is our world ever going to be the same? We are controlled, we're influenced so much by fear. Faith is, of course, theological, but it's also something that we practice each and every day. Pay attention. We put faith in something as small as an alarm clock. And we set our alarm clock hoping that at whatever time you need to wake up, this little box will make a loud enough noise to wake you up so you can get up and get ready for work and get in your car and drive through traffic and get to work so your boss will pay you a paycheck so you can take care of your entire family. We'll put our faith in some little bitty alarm clock. While doing so, we put our faith in other human beings as we driving our car 70 plus miles an hour through traffic around a bunch of people who drive way worse than you do. We put faith in them. We put faith in our bank. When we put our little deposit slip and put our check into that tube and it sucks it from our car into the building and we trust that person will be honest enough to put our money in our account. We trust the bank. We trust Wall Street. We trust folks who cook our food and serve our food. We flew to... Puerto Rico last summer, my first time on a plane, and unless something very drastic happens, my last time on a plane. But I can remember flying in this airplane. Now, you've flown many times before, I'm sure, but an airplane is the same shape as a tube of sausage. Much bigger, of course. And we were in this tube flying 500 miles an hour, 30,000 feet above the ocean, and we trusted that pilot to to have no issues of his health or anything. And we left a building in Atlanta and flew to another building in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And both those buildings were called a terminal. And as we approached both San Juan and back home to Atlanta, the pilot came on the, over, over the radio and he said, uh, we're making our final approach. Final, really? You couldn't take another better word than final approach? And what's interesting is most people who do this, they Google and they search trying to find the cheapest ticket they can find. And they do this every week, some people. We put our faith and trust in things uh, all the time, usually with very little fear. With that being said, can we not trust God that way? Let me give us three thoughts this morning about overcoming our fear with faith, with faith, first of all, look in our text in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 6. Notice the instrument of faith. The instrument of faith. Above all, Paul said, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You ever thought about that shield of faith? The shield of faith is a piece of armor that the Roman infantry soldier would carry. This equipment would be 
big enough he could protect his whole body. Most times these shields were about four feet tall and about two and a half feet wide. These shields were made of, of leather stretched around uh, uh, wood reinforced at the top and the bottom on the sides by, by strips of metal. And in Bible times, often the enemy soldiers would take their, fire, their darts and take their arrows, they'd dip those things in poison, and they'd shoot them at you. And so much poison would be there that if it barely nicked your arm, enough poison would be in your body, it would kill you quick and painfully. Other times they would take their darts and their spears and dip them in pitch and set that pitch on fire and sling those arrows into the, into the Roman camp and set the entire camp on fire. Of all the equipment the Roman soldier would carry, only the shield had a specific purpose. Paul said the shield was used to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. An Old Testament scholar named Peter O'Brien, he said that these fiery darts represent every kind of attack launched by the devil and his demons against the people of God. They are as wide-ranging as the insidious wiles that promote them and include not only every kind of temptation to ungodly behavior, doubt, despair, also external assaults such as persecution and false teaching. And as a Christian throughout our life, we have been, we will be, we will continue to be bombarded with all the thousands and thousands of fiery darts launched at us by our enemy and his minions. And the only way to protect ourselves is to, is to deploy our shield of faith. 1 John 5, 4 tells us very simply, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Listen please, even our faith. We notice the instrument of faith, number one. Number two, write this down. Notice the instruction of faith. The instruction of faith. I like what the book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. How do you describe to somebody what faith is? And how does this faith, how does this faith help us overcome uh, the fiery darts of the devil? We got to remember that faith is more than believing. Watch this. Faith is more than believing because the Bible tells us in James 2, 19 that even the demons believe and they tremble. So it's more than just you and I believing. A man named Kent Hughes said this. He tells us that in its simplest form, faith is belief plus trust. It's resting in the, pers in the person of God and His Word to us. Faith is putting our belief and our trust in God doing what God says He's going to do. Faith is, a, is an act of practice. It's built on belief. It's not ambiguous. It's not unsure. It's a concrete conviction. It's the present day confidence built upon God and the assurance of all of His promises what faith is. A lady named Marla Runyon, at age nine, she was diagnosed with a disease called the Stargardt disease. This disease is a degenerative macular condition that soon left her legally blind. Objects in front of Runyon appear as empty spaces. Around the periphery of her vision, she can make out vague forms and colors. Runyon was determined that her impairment would not ruin her life. After high school, she attended San Diego State where she earned two master's degrees with the help of special equipment and volunteer readers. While there, she began competing in track events. From 1992 to 1999, she won five gold medals in the Paralympic Games, including the 1,500-meter race at the Pan American Games. In the year 2000 and again 2004, Runyon qualified for the U.S. Olympic team and became the first legally blind person to compete in the Olympic Games, placing eighth, the top American woman finisher, in the 1,500-meter event in Sydney, Australia in 2006. She won her second national championship in the 20K event. Runyon learned to stay in her lane and make the turns on the track using her limited peripheral vision. Although she could not see how far she had run during a race, she learned to pace herself by hearing the intensity of her competitor's breathing. 
One baffled interviewer asked how she could run toward the finish line. She couldn't even see. She replied, I can't see it, but I know it's there. That's what faith is. We're believing a God whom we cannot see to keep His promises in which we have not seen yet. By faith, we move forward in life even though our destination is not clear sometimes. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, faith is taking the first step when you don't see the entire staircase. You know what's happening during this corona pandemic? The devil is taking his fiery darts of fear and he's throwing them into your camp one after another after another. And these darts are saying something like this. This is never going to end. We're we're all going to lose our jobs. We're going to lose our retirement. We're going to get sick. We're going to lose loved ones. Uh, Life will never be normal. We'll never, ever be able to go back to church. We can't ever again buy toilet paper for crying out loud. The devil's telling us. And I want you to exercise your faith. And when those fiery darts of fear and doubt head your way, you as a child of God, you take that shield of faith and hold up that shield of faith and live by faith and walk by faith and let that shield do what that shield is supposed to do. It does what God says it's going to do. It's going to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. When was the last time you read through Hebrews 11? I read through it a few times this week and again this morning, and I was reminded, I was reminded what God's people can do when they overcome their faith. Very interesting. Sixteen times in one chapter of our Bible we read that God's people did something amazing and they did it by faith. Listen, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David all did great and mighty things by faith. And I can almost guarantee you one thing, at least one point in their life, they were scared to death. But they took the shield of faith and their fears were overcome by their faith. I'll say it again, their their, their fear was overcome by their faith. There's two times in the Bible that the Bible tells us that Jesus was marveled at something. And there's two times in the Bible that that they, they both have to do with faith. The word marveled means to be amazed by. So there's two times in God's Word that we read that Jesus was amazed by a level of faith. The first story is... In Matthew chapter 8, the Bible tells us this story about this centurion man. And, and, and you know the story. He had so much faith in Jesus Christ that he told Jesus, he says, Jesus, you don't need to come to my house and heal my servant. I trust you enough. I believe you enough that Jesus, if you'll just say the words, I know that my servant will be healed. Listen, that's faith. In Matthew 8, 10 says this, Jesus heard it, he marveled. Jesus Christ was marveled. This man's faith was that large. Another time when Jesus was marveled at faith is found in Mark chapter 6. This time, though, he was marveled at the disciples at their unbelief. Now, that's pretty interesting to me. Two times the Lord was amazed. He was marveled. And they both had to do with faith. One, because of great faith. Well, because of a lack of faith. If we're going to overcome our fear, we have to get to the point in our life where our faith is amazing to our Lord. Can I ask you a question? As you deal with this coronavirus, whatever's happened to you and your family, are, are you dealing with this uh, pandemic uh, with a faith that amazes the Lord? Faith is overcome. Faith is what overcomes our Fears. Number three, notice the increasing of faith. The increasing of faith. I think it's pretty, pretty obvious that we need more faith. And really, not just during this time, but really all the time, we need more faith. So where do we get it? 
Now that's the question for the ages, isn't it? Where do we get faith from? Is there an app on our phone? Can I log into my, uh, to my, uh, to my app page and go to the app store and put in my code and push download? Can I download faith? Can I go on faith.com and use my PayPal account and type in my numbers and push buy? Can I buy more faith? Can, can I inherit faith from my parents? Will, will Amazon ship me some faith? No, it won't. Where do we get it from? If we need it all the time, where does faith come from? How does our faith increase? Let me give you these five things and we'll be done. First of all, faith is increased by preaching. By preaching. One of the, one of the reasons why I felt like doing these online services is because I realized both me and you, we need preaching. And it's not so much that it's me doing the preaching, it's the fact that somebody is preaching the Bible. Faith is increased by preaching. Romans 10, 17 says very plainly, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Paul is telling us in the book of Romans, he's telling us that the critical need in every Christian's life, especially during a time of trial and uncertainty, faith is generated by hearing God's Word preached. A young man named Nicky Cruz was born in Puerto Rico to witchcraft practicing parents who abused him profoundly. At the age of 15, boiling with anger and rage, he was sent to New York to live with his brother. Instead, Nicky ran away to live in the streets of New York. He joined the notorious Brooklyn Mau Mau Gang and quickly became their warlord. He descended into a maelstrom of drugs and alcohol and brutality, brutality which worsened after the fellow gang member was fatally stabbed and beaten and he died in Nicky's arms. Nicky was arrested countless times and a psychiatrist predicted that Nicky would be headed to jail, the electric chair, and then to hell. When street preacher David Wilkerson told Nicky of God's enduring love, Nicky beat him, spat on him, and threatened his life. Wilkerson replied, You could cut me up into a thousand pieces and every piece will still love you. Wilkerson replied, his reply gained a foothold in Nicky's brain. And shortly afterward, he and his gang showed up at a Wilkerson rally held in a boxing arena. Wilkerson preached on Christ's crucifixion and the love that led him to the cross. The message grabbed Nicky's heart as he described, I was choked with pain, he said, and tears became, uh, began to come down my face and more tears and I was fighting and then I surrendered. A few other Mau Mau members were also converted that night. And the next day they went to the police station and turned in all their handguns, their knives, and their bricks. The stunned police said it was good that thing they didn't see the gang coming because they would have indeed opened fire. Nicky left the gang, enrolled in Bible college, got married, and moved back to New York where he ran Teen Challenge, a program for troubled teens. He converted many of his old fellow Mau Mau's, including their new leader, and since becoming a world-traveling evangelist and author and head of Nikki Cruz Ministries, I said that to say this, where would Nikki Cruz be without the preaching of God's Word? He'd be where the psychiatrist said he'd be. He'd be in jail or the electric chair or maybe even in hell. Preaching is so important. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved... It is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Here's the point. Here's what God is saying. If we want our, our faith to be increased, it is only increased, it's increased first of all by hearing the preaching of the Word of God. Number two, faith's increased by problem. You say, what now, preacher? That sounds terrible to say, but it's true. Our faith is increased as we go through problems. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, here's what the Apostle Paul said. Paul said, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, 
in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. And here's the key. For when I am weak, Paul says, then am I strong. Nobody wants to hear this, that as we go through problems, as we go through pandemics, as we go through, uh, as we go through shelter in place, as we go through quarantine, as we go through these situations, nobody wants to hear that those things increase our faith, but they do. None of us want problems, do we? I mean, you're crazy if you sit down at night and you pray, God, give me a problem so my faith will get stronger. No, you'd be insane to pray that prayer. We, we, we all want smooth sailing. We all want happy relationships. We all want plenty of money. We all want a great health. We all want job security. But like we've learned the last month, none of that is always going to be true. We all have some kind of problem in life. And God uses those problems to deepen our faith in Him. Life's most challenging and life's most fearful times can be the best opportunity for you and I to realize just how strong our God is. Go back to what Paul said in, first, in 2 Corinthians 12. He said this, and I'm paraphrasing. Paul said, I don't mind the problems because in these problems I realize just how strong my God is. Let me say it again. We need problems to increase our faith. Number three, faith is increased by people. By people. In Mark chapter 2, we're told an amazing story. It's one of my favorite miracles in all of God's Word. And I thought about this. Paul told us in Ephesians 6 to take the shield of faith and with that shield of faith, we can withstand the fiery darts of the wicked one. But you read it carefully, we're never told to, to hold up our shield of faith all by ourselves. It's interesting, doing some research the past few days, preparing for the sermon this morning, I, I, I learned a couple of things about this shield that these Roman soldiers would carry. However, the shield was carried by an individual soldier, but it was most effective when it was combined with other soldiers also using their shield. Most military experts believe that the shield was actually designed to interlock with other soldiers who were standing next to you. And these shields of several soldiers together interlocked would be even more of an impenetrable barrier. You see, one soldier with a shield of faith could do great things, but can you imagine an entire platoon of soldiers holding their shield of faith up? How much more faith that would be? And so when you and I, when we, when we deploy our shield of faith against the fiery dart of fear, we're able to overcome it. And, and, and I just wonder what would happen if all of us together all around the world would take our shield of faith as a child of God. What else could we do for God? In Mark chapter 2, we read about uh, a man that was paralyzed. You know the story well. And uh, these, this man had four friends. And the Bible tells us that these four friends of this paralyzed man, they go down to the paralyzed man's house and they go into his room and they pick up the, his bed and they carry him down to a house where they know the Lord is, the Lord's preaching, the Lord's doing miracles. And they say, they say we got to get our friend down to where Jesus is because we know he can heal him. And so these four friends, uh, they carry this crippled man in his bed down to the house. They get there and to their surprise, they cannot get in the house because the crowd is just too big there's too many folks there so these four friends uh, they take this man up on top of the house they cut a hole in the roof and they lower him down to where the Lord is and in Mark chapter 2 verse 5 the Bible says this please listen carefully and when he saw their faith he said unto the sick of the palsy son thy sins be forgiven thee now, just like you, I've read the story dozens of times. And I've never quite seen that before. The Bible says that when Jesus, He healed the man, not just because of the faith of the paralyzed man, 
But when he saw the faith of the paralyzed man, listen please, and all four of his friends, when he saw their faith, he healed the man. These four men, they deployed their shield of faith and Jesus saw this shield of faith and he healed them. I'll say it again, our faith is increased by people. Can I ask you today, as you are dealing with this worldwide crisis we're going through, does your faith help somebody else's faith? We've noticed already faith is increased by preaching. Faith is increased by problems. Faith is increased by people. Number four, notice faith is increased by purpose. By purpose. The Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 5, listen carefully please, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Listen, every person has a purpose. And there's no person, there's no soul, there's no individual that was created just to simply exist. No, listen, we all have a purpose, and realizing that purpose helps our faith to increase. There's an amazing man, his name is Daniel Ritchie. He was born without arms. And it was challenging enough learning to function by eating with his feet and toes and to get himself dressed and groom himself and eat and open doors and to drive using his feet, but he did it. His greater challenge, however, was dealing with the attitudes projected toward him. He endured stares and insults and rudeness. His family was even asked to leave a restaurant because his eating with his feet offended the other diners. The worst was the assumption, sometimes expressed directly, that he was a hopeless mistake, a misfit woefully insufficient to lead a full life. And as a result, Daniel came to believe that assumption. He developed a hatred for himself and for the people who disdained him. And even God, if there was a God. Daniel Ritchie was not a Christian and he had almost no friends. But one night a classmate invited him to his church. That evening the preacher gave a simple devotion on the love of God for all people. He quoted Psalm 139, 14, where the Bible says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. This message, it spoke to Daniel's heart and he realized that, that God had even created him for a purpose and he too was a marvelous work of God. Every bit as much as those who had arms. That night, Daniel Ritchie gave his life to Christ. Shortly afterward, he felt called to ministry. He now preaches and speaks at churches, conferences, youth events in the U.S. and abroad. And as he puts it, he uses his empty sleeves to point people toward God. Can our mind all of us today that every one of us has been given a purpose by Almighty God before we were even born? And this purpose, especially during these days in which we live, fulfilling this purpose is going to take more faith. And it's going to take more faith than we had yesterday and even more faith tomorrow. You ever thought about why the Lord gave the disciples certain callings? Why would the Lord have disciples to go out two by two and to heal the sick and to cast out demons and preach? And, and why would the Lord tell these disciples to take 5,000 men and their wives and their kids and, and feed all the crowd, the multitude, with two fish and five loaves of bread? And you ever wonder why the Lord would say to his disciples, to these 12 people to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why would he do this? Because it was his purpose for them and it was going to take them having a whole lot of faith. And I can almost promise you that they probably also had some fear. But in order to fulfill their purpose, they were going to have to let their faith overcome their fear. Number five, notice number five will be done. Number five, faith is increased 
by perspective. Perspective. Over in Luke chapter 17, there's a very interesting phrase, and it's found in verse 5. Luke 17, verse 5 and 6. Listen to what the Bible says, please. And the apostles said unto the Lord, listen to this phrase, Lord, <laughs> increase our faith. And in verse 6, the Lord says, okay, I will. The Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted into the sea, and it shall obey you. <laughs> so they say, Lord, increase our faith. I wonder if just one of the disciples said something like this, Shh, don't say that. Because we know when you say that, we got to do something. And so they say, Lord, increase our faith. He says, okay, you asked for it, here you go. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could speak to this sycamore tree, and you could say, be plucked up by the root, and go over to the ocean, and be planted over there, and that sycamore tree would obey you, and it would do it. In Matthew 17, 20, we read about... Jesus said if you had the faith inside the mustard seed, you could literally move a mountain from this place to another place. In other words, please get this. The important issue was not the size of their faith because a mustard seed is almost minuscule. The important thing was not the size of their faith. The important thing is the size of their God. The disciples, and so do we, need proper perspective in order for our faith to increase. Jesus said, with a little bit of faith and a whole lot of God, we can do all kind of stuff. I worked for the city of Covington Fire Department for 12 years. The last seven years, I was the driver. And this means nothing to any of you watching, but I drove engine three for one year and engine two for six years. Engine two weighed well over 30,000 pounds. When it was full of water, full of hose, full of equipment, all that, weighed 30,000 pounds. And I wouldn't do this because it'd be against the SOP, but if I wanted to, I could take just one finger... And with one finger, drive that 15-ton fire truck around the streets of Covington, around circles backwards and forwards, and, and through neighborhoods and cul-de-sacs. I could do all that with one finger because of a wonderful invention called power steering. And the strength, the power to move that fire truck through the streets of Covington was not found in my finger, but it was found in the power steering. My finger only activated the power when I put my finger to use. That's how faith works. Faith has to have an object. And to the child of God, that object is Jesus Christ. And that object of our faith is greater, is stronger, is more powerful, is more mighty than you and I could ever be. And Jesus told His disciples, and He told me and you today, some 2,000 years later, that if our faith is only that big, we can move mountains and move trees. In order for you and I to overcome our fears... We must have faith in something that is greater and stronger and more powerful than any of us. And the one who was greater and stronger and more powerful, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. I'm going to ask you this morning, what kind of faith do you have? Is your faith like these people's faith who by faith they overcome all these obstacles. Nowhere do we read that they didn't have any fears. We read this though, that they had faith. Faith, how big? Mustard seed sized. Now, I wonder today, does this coronavirus, does it have you 
Does it have your faith waning? Does it have your faith weakening? Uh, why don't you today take the shield of faith and use that faith and hold that faith up and walk by faith and live by faith and believe in God and trust in God so when all these fiery darts of fear and doubt and concern and worry and trouble come after you, you can take that shield which God's given you us, that shield of faith and quench, put out all those fiery darts of the wicked one. And I also ask you today, are you sure you're saved? If you were to die today, for whatever reason, calamity of life, sickness, accident, whatever, do you know for sure that you're saved, that you'd go to heaven? Can I remind you today how much God loves you? He loved you so much, He sent His only Son, Jesus, to die for your sin. He shed His blood on the cross of Calvary so you might be free. You might be able to go to heaven. Have you put your faith and trust in Him today? If not, you can do that. The Bible tells us if, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you saved? Is your faith overcoming your fears? If not, God's given you a shield. Deploy that shield. Hold up that shield. Trust that shield. Believe in that shield. And the Bible says this, by the authority of God's Word, we can quench those fiery darts of the wicked. As we play the piano for a moment, let's have a moment of just reflection. Bow your heads, please, wherever you are. And uh, let's pray in a moment and ask God to bless His Word to our hearts this morning. Father, we are so thankful today that we can be under the sound of your word. Whatever avenue you've chosen this morning to listen to the word of God, whether it's through the internet, Facebook, whatever, Lord, uh, I, I pray that your word this morning has, has done what it's supposed to do. And that's to touch our hearts, speak to our hearts. And I do pray, God, that you allow your people not to live in fear, You've told us in your word that you didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love and a power and of a sound mind. So God, help us today be reminded of the importance of our shield of faith. Help us to use it to, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And help us, Lord, as a people of God, to trust you today like we've never trusted you before. Help us to live by faith. Help us to serve by faith. Help us to be blessings to other people by faith. And when it's all said and done, when all this is over with, help us to all be able to look back and say, we're so glad we trusted the Lord. And I pray, Lord, for those that may be listening that, do, that are not sure they're a Christian. They're not sure they have a home in heaven. They're not sure they've been forgiven. I pray right now, God, that you convict their heart. Give them a saving knowledge of Christ. They might, by faith, call upon Jesus and be saved this morning. Whatever you do, we'll be, we'll be grateful for all of that. We give you today all praise and all glory and all honor. I pray in Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. God bless you for listening today. Have a great day. We'll see you next Sunday.